Hello everyone, I'm Victoria from the Missouri History Museum and this month's virtual learning day is focusing on African-American art and culture. For this gallery stop, we will be traveling through time to understand how arts and music in particular have been created, modified, and passed down from generations of African-Americans in the U.S. as tools of resistance, revolution, and resilience. So think about it, why do we have music? And why do people compose, perform, produce, and write music? Think about your favorite song. What do you like about it? How does it make you feel? Today, we are going to explore a bit of history through music, and we are going to take a peek into the African-American experience in the United States. The very first ship carrying West Africans to the United States landed in 1619. Even during this long journey, crammed into ships, these people who were stolen from their land spoke to each other through songs. The white crew could not understand what they were saying because of the language barrier, but they could detect a sorrowful tone and hear the men sing and the women answer in response. Enslaved people used this music to secretly communicate with each other while doing strenuous labor outside. Harriet Tubman used music and songs to communicate to enslaved peoples and help them escape to freedom on the Underground Railroad. One of her favorite songs to sing was called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, which you might have heard this song before. And this is how it goes. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming for to me, coming for to carry me home. Take a moment to pause the video and think about how this song makes you feel. What do you think this song might have meant to enslave people who heard it? And what might other people have thought when they heard it? Now, what if I told you that enslaved people use code words in their music to communicate with each other. In Frederick Douglass's book, My Bondage and My Freedom, he mentions many songs talked about going home or being bound for the land of Canaan, such that if you just heard the song, you would think people were singing about going to heaven. But they were actually singing about going to northern states or to Canada for freedom. So, pause the video here to take a close look at the lyrics and see if you can try to decode line by line the lyrics of this song and who might be singing it and who might that person be singing to. I'm here in our current exhibit to tell you about the 1819 case that took place here even before the famous Dred Scott case highlighted in our exhibit. In 1819, Missouri was not an official state, but it was wanting to be one. Free blacks and whites gathered here on the steps of the courthouse to protest admitting Missouri into the United States as a slave state. When Missouri was admitted to the U.S., it was admitted as a slave state, meaning that slavery was legal here, but only on the condition that Maine and the North was admitted as a free state, meaning that slavery was illegal there. The reason I've highlighted this is to give you a little context about the history around the time. The songs deeply rooted in West African music, such as Call and Response, have largely been preserved and passed down as hymns and spirituals and kept in the context of the African American church. All right, let's now move forward in history to the emergence of blues and jazz music. Slavery became illegal in the U.S. in 1865 
after the North won the Civil War. This meant that all the white slave owners had to free the black enslaved people they once owned by law. These previously enslaved African Americans began moving north in the Great Migration in the early 1900s. And St. Louis actually had a great influence on the emergence of blues and jazz music. So be sure to check out our other gallery stop with our friend Ryan where you can learn how to make your own blues music. So in the 1920s, as more and more African Americans migrated north for more job opportunities and safety, they brought their experiences with them as well. In Harlem, New York, it was the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, which was a time period and space that allowed black people, artists, writers, poets, full creativity. During this time, the piano was also introduced to the music scene, and it was showcased as a more sophisticated instrument. So during this time, poets like Langston Hughes, a Missouri native, and musicians like Scott Joplin, who we have here, used their new location and new experiences of migrating north to create poetry like One Way Ticket by Langston Hughes and the musical genre Ragtime, which Scott Joplin created. And this genre eventually contributed to the creation of blues and jazz music. And so while many African Americans moved north and left the south, there were many that stayed. However, they were treated poorly and even attacked or discriminated against. This experience too was put into songs and poetry. The most striking was the song Strange Fruit, sung by Billie Holiday, an African American jazz singer. It was originally a poem that sought to comment on the state of the country and what was going on. When people hear the Civil Rights era, they probably think of the Deep South, Jim Crow laws, things like that. But it was truly something all parts of the U.S. had to deal with. We, here in St. Louis, had our own parts in the Civil Rights Movement. And here's one example of that. In 1963, CORE, a group focused on racial equality, started a group protest. They had sit-ins in the lobby of Jefferson Bank and Trust after writing the bank a letter asking them to hire four black employees in decent paying jobs. The nonviolent protests went on for seven months before change happened. Over 150 black and white protesters took part in the demonstrations. During the sit-ins, protesters would sing hymns and spirituals much like was done in the larger civil rights protests in the South in states like Alabama. Two commonly sung civil rights anthems are Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around and We Shall Overcome. So now take a look at the lyrics on the screen and think about these questions. So the first song, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, goes like this. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching to the freedom land. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching to the freedom land. And the second song, We Shall Overcome, goes like this. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Okay, now take a minute to pause and write down words in the lyrics that stand out to you in these two different songs. How do you think they made protesters feel to sing? How do you think ain't gonna let nobody turn me around? How did that make you feel? And how did hearing the second song, We Shall Overcome, make you feel? Take a minute 
and talk this question out with an adult or friend watching with you. Former Representative Lacey Clay described the Jefferson Bank demonstrations as different because it focused on civil disobedience, which was a tactic new to St. Louis at the time. So on the very first day of protest, a group picketed for about 60 minutes, and then in the late afternoon, nearly two dozen people locked arms and sang, we shall not be moved. They sat down to block the front entrance of the bank. Doing this, they defied a court order against such demonstrations, and some were even arrested, even though this was a nonviolent protest. At the end of March 1964, the demonstrations ended after the bank quietly hired five black clerical workers. This event, though, is said to have helped open the doors wider to clerical and sales jobs for African American businesses in St. Louis businesses. The Jefferson Bank protest lasted for roughly seven months. Do you believe the songs of this period encouraged demonstrators? I would like you to take a closer look at the lyrics. How do you think they affected the protesters? And why do you think they sung these songs and hymns? In 1962, in a speech he gave, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the freedom songs are playing a strong and vital role in our struggle. They give the people new courage and a sense of unity. I think that they keep alive a faith, a radiant hope, in the future, particularly in our most trying hours. So throughout the rest of the 20th century, there was an explosion of new genres, from the boogie-woogie, ragtime, doo-wop, jazz, rockabilly, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, soul, jazz, disco, and hip-hop. <laughs> Many of these genres build on each other and blend older African-American music styles with new. These styles were popularized by Motown hits, singers, and groups that helped to desegregate the radios in the 1960s. Particularly interesting is the development of hip-hop in the 1970s and 1980s. This style built on old African-American musical forms like blues and poetry to create a unique style. Groups during this time, like NWA and Public Enemy, rooted much of their work in social protests and calling people to action for a change. So, as hip-hop entered in the 1990s, genres including jazz, soul, reggae, and rock were also incorporated into these sounds. And like with many other genres, the lyrics deal with both personal and wider social issues. Today, hip-hop continues to be a vital area of popular music, and it often serves as a vehicle for observing and commenting on society, much like Strange Fruit did in the 1930s and 40s. When protesters flooded the streets in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, rather than rally together and sing We Shall Overcome, which, as we just learned, was one of the unifying songs of the 1960s civil rights era, People instead began to gather and chant Kendrick Lamar's song, All Right. For protesters, it represented a song that had some sort of end in sight. According to one protester, they said the song, We Shall Overcome, doesn't tell us when we shall overcome. It's saying that we will overcome someday, and we in the streets, what we wanted, we just wanted justice now. The lyrics to Kendrick Lamar's song, All Right, go like this. Wouldn't you know, we've been hurt, been down before. When our pride was low, looking at the world like, where do we go? But we gon' be all right. 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 Do you hear me? Do you feel me? We gon' be all right. So now I have a mission for you. As we learn, music can tell many different stories. I would like you to pick a song and explore its lyrics. Look closely, and if it's a new song, you can listen carefully to the lyrics, and you can draw a picture or a group of pictures to tell the story of what the music makes you feel. So thank you so much for joining me on this brief journey 
from slavery to blues and jazz to civil rights era to present day to better understand black music, its roots, and how it's laid the foundation for so much of the music that we listen to today. And remember, keep making history. Bye.